Good afternoon, everyone. And the first item of business this afternoon is portfolio questions. And in order to get as many people in as possible, I'd be grateful for short and succinct questions and indeed answers. Question one, Margaret McCulloch. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what action is taken to boost the economy in central Scotland. Cabinet Secretary John Swinney. President Officer, the Scottish Government is committed to boosting economic growth and tackling inequality across Scotland. In central Scotland, we continue to support economic growth with substantial infrastructure investment and help to businesses, enabling them to grow and create employment. Businesses across central Scotland have benefited from £53 million of regional selective assistance since 2007, creating and safeguarding 7,000 jobs. Almost 2,000 employment opportunities have been created for young people through the, the Youth Employment Scotland Fund. A further 145 jobs have been created through £7.5 million support from the Scottish Government's Regeneration Capital Grant Fund. Thank you. Margaret McCulloch. Thank the Cabinet Secretary for his reply. The Government will be aware of my concerns about the decline of the manufacturing base in East Kilbride and the impact that the withdrawal of Rolls-Royce from the town later this year could have on the wider economy of the region. Could the Scottish Government therefore update me on their involvement with the multi-agency East Kilbride Task Force and explain how they and their par partners are promoting the town as a destination for inward investment? First of all, I, I would say to uh, Margaret McCulloch that the Government entirely uh, supports the sentiments that she has set out of the importance of manufacturing industry for, uh, for Scotland, in particular for uh, towns like East Kilbride, which have a very strong uh, record, a track record in the field of manufacturing. Um, the Government participates in the East Kilbride Task Force, uh, which is run by the local authority, uh, through our partners um, Scottish Enterprise uh, and Skills Development Scotland, and obviously through the wider input of organisations that the Government uh, substantially funds, um, such as South Lanarkshire College. Um, the focus of the task force is on finding opportunities to deal with the circumstances that um, Margaret McCulloch raised in, in relation to the transfer of, of Rolls-Royce's activities from East Kilbride to Renfrewshire. Um, the Government also is very keen to use the available devices through the, um, the work of Scottish Enterprise and Scottish Development International to promote uh, East Kilbride as a destination for inward investment and also to support the company base of East Kilbride to expand their activities through international business activities and Scottish Development International would be very keen to support companies with uh, growth prospects in that respect. Many thanks. Uh, question two, Liz Smith. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what discussions it's had with Tesco regarding recent closure announcements. Cabinet Secretary John Swinney. President, so this is a very worrying time for all those affected by the uh, Tesco announcement to close four stores in Scotland, including the Superstore in Kirkcaldy, with 189 employees. In a joint initiative with the Leader of Fife Council, I wrote to the Chief Executive of Tesco offering assistance as part of efforts to reverse the situation. Scottish Government officials and Fife Council met Tesco representatives on the 2nd of February to discuss the issues faced by the company and to express our concern about the effects the closures would have on communities, employees and their families. In addition, officials in the Scottish Government and Skills Development Scotland have been in contact with Tesco to offer support through our Partnership Action for Continuing Employment PACE initiative for any employees who may be facing redundancy. Uh, could I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that reply and also for his uh, parliamentary response, which I received yesterday. Uh, given the fact that the recent round of uh, Tesco closures and uh, non-openings have accounted for 16% share of the UK closures and non-openings, which is obviously disproportionate given that we have 8.5% of the population share, can the Cabinet Secretary give a categorical assurance that there will be no successor tax to the public health supplement, which the Scottish Government was forced to abandon because it would make the retail sector, which is so important in this country, uncompetitive? Cabinet Secretary. Well, the first, the first thing to say is that um, the, the government uh, is, um, actively supports the retail sector in taking from, forward its developments, and we enjoy a good and constructive discussions with the Scottish Retail Consortium, who do a lot of very good work in advancing the interests of the retail sector in Scotland. Secondly, as, as a matter of record, I wasn't forced to abandon the public health supplement. I, I said it would be in place for three years, and it was in place for three years, and it came to an end when I said it would come to an end, just like I predicted it would be. Um, as a, I'm sure 
uh, Liz Smith knows, who is an assiduous follower of my every word, um, there, are no provisions in the, uh, there are no provisions in the Government's financial plans to introduce such a supplement. Margaret McCulloch, another assiduous follower. <laughs> Thank you, President Officer. In the recent times, we have seen, on one hand, a reaction against Tesco towns and in the other, a community coming together to save an anchor store in their town centre. Would the Minister agree, however, that we all should be concerned by reports at the weekend of redundancies potentially rising to 10,000 and that averting further job losses must be a priority in discussions with Tesco? I think the, 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 the issue of you know, we cannot disguise the fact that the retail sector and some of the um, major employment that is underpinned by not just Tesco but other um, supermarket chains is very significant now within the Scottish economy. So therefore, the example in Kirkcaldy, where um, 189 job losses um, uh, may well arise from the closure of the store, um, is a very significant loss of employment in one particular community. And, um, the, the other examples in, uh, in, in, in Troon, which will be known to the presiding officer, and in Edinburgh and Grangeworth, are of, they're not as significant, but they are, in their own localities, a significant announcements into the bargain. The assurance I would give Margaret McCulloch um, is this, that on every occasion we face these difficulties, and we face employment loss from time to time in different parts of the country, the work of the PACE service, which Mr Ewing has led and which has been the subject of debate in Parliament, um, is focused entirely on ensuring that we can, uh, we can uh, maximise employment opportunities for individuals that are adversely affected by these decisions. Thank you. And finally, Mr Day, Graham Day. Sorry. Right, that was a mistake, right? Uh, question three, Angus MacDonald to ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to boost the economy in the Falkirk Council area. Cabinet Secretary John Swinney. President, so the Scottish Government is committed to growing the Falkirk economy and creating employment opportunities by working closely with our delivery partners, including Falkirk Council. Um, our commitment to boosting the economy was demonstrated by our approval of Falkirk Council's £67 million Grangemouth tax incremental financing project, which is expected to lever in £413 million in private investment, creating almost 6,000 jobs and hundreds of apprenticeships. Angus MacDonald. I very much welcome the initiatives already underway, especially the Falkirk Grangemouth TIF, which will give a major boost to and allow exciting opportunities in the industrial sector in Grangemouth. However, Grangemouth is also a residential community, and with the recently announced closure of Tesco Metro, as uh, the Cabinet Secretary, the Deputy First Minister, has already mentioned, and Matheson's the Bakers in the town, uh, residents are concerned about the reduction in footfall in the town centre. Will the Cabinet Secretary continue to work with Falkirk Council to ensure there is a bright future, not just for the industrial sector in Grangemouth, but also for the 18,000 residents who require a vibrant town centre? Cabinet Secretary. I, I appreciate the point made by Mr Macdonald, and uh, I think he, he raises an important question about the future and the vitality of town centres, which is an important consideration of the government, um, not just in, the, uh, in the, 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 the much larger towns in the locality of Falkirk, but indeed also in the smaller towns uh, such as Grangemouth. Um, the Town Centre Action Plan sets out a range of actions to help town centres um, uh, remain and or, or become vibrant. This includes expanding fresh start rates relief for small businesses, increasing opportunities for town centre living and agreeing the town centre first principle um, as part of our wider discussions on this question. Um, I, uh, I would also say to Mr Macdonald that um, the Government, through its work with Falkirk Council um, in the economic partnership, um, will be meeting this Friday, and the partnership will consider its economic strategy and Grangemouth vision, which I think will help in this respect. And finally, President Officer, can I say that I think Falkirk is a very good example of a community that has faced very significant changes in its economic base, has responded to them with tremendous courage and vision. And indeed, the combination of the, uh, the visitor attractions in Falkirk, between the Falkirk Wheel and the Kelpies and the Helix programme, are an example to us all of how real creativity and vision can be taken forward to improve the economic fortunes of people in our country. Many thanks. Question four, Jenny Mara. 
to ask the Scottish Government what discussions it has had with Dundee City Council, Scottish Enterprise, Forth Ports and Decom North Sea about the opportunities in Dundee for decommissioning oil and gas facilities. Minister Fergus Ewing. We engage regularly with relevant parties as to the opportunities that decommissioning provides. So, in order to maximise economic recovery from oil and gas fields, it is necessary the UK Government acts to reinstil investor confidence. It is also necessary to avoid the premature decommissioning of installations serving fields which still have a viable life of further production of oil and gas. To avoid such premature decommissioning, it is essential that the UK Government deliver in their March budget a package comprising substantial tax reduction measures along the lines, Presiding Officer, of the package I outlined to Parliament on 8 January this year. Many thanks. Jenny Mara. Thank you, President Officer. Well, it's a very interesting answer because nobody is suggesting pre premature decommissioning of any facilities. And indeed, my question was not about what the UK government was doing, but what about the Scottish government in this chamber? Now, the last time I raised this issue, the, the minister told me that he had published his decommissioning strategy. The minister be, will be aware that Dundee City Council and his SNP colleagues there are engaging on this issue. Will the minister accept my invitation to come with me to Dundee and to meet all four? Uh, parties that I have suggested to see how he can help them facilitate um, really getting opportunities from this multi-billion pound industrial opportunity in Scotland. Minister. Uh, well, it's very generous of Ms Mara to extend the invitation, but in fact I have already had the opportunity to engage with uh, Councillor Ken Guild, with Stan Ewer, uh, with Charles Hammond of Fourth Ports, and also with Scottish Enterprise staff and have had discussions with them. We have also, of course, published a strategy in October 2014, a decommissioning in the North Sea review of decommissioning a capacity. Uh, and it's, it's plain that there are significant opportunities, as has been stated. But if Jenny Mara seriously believes that there is no risk of premature decommissioning of installations of the North Sea, then I'm afraid she is sadly mistaken, because that is precisely the risk that Oil & Gas UK have been warning the UK Government about. And a very substantial number of the existing over 400 installations in the North Sea, because of their ageing nature and the relatively small deposits of oil and gas remaining, but still economically viable, face precisely that fate unless there is an appropriate and substantial tax reduction measure. And I'm hopeful the UK Government will heed the more informed voice of Oil and Gas UK and other commentators in this regard when they make their budget announcement in March. Thank you. Question five, Kevin Stewart. Uh, thank you, President Officer. And I have a great fear of premature decommissioning. And in that light, I'd like to ask the Scottish Government, uh, in light of the financial impact in the industry in Scotland, what discussions it has had with the UK Government regarding the oil and gas fiscal regime. Officer, I attended the UK Government pilot meeting, as I always do, on the 13th of January. It was chaired by Matt Hancock, the current UK Minister with Responsibility for Oil and Gas. At that meeting, I summarised the Scottish Government proposals set out in this chamber on the 8th of January, uh, and uh, I, I, I endorsed them to the UK Government and are to our colleagues. Uh, representing the Conservative and Liberal Democrat parties in this chamber. Stuart. Uh, thank you, President Officer, and I thank the Minister for his answer. Uh, following the introduction of an exploration tax credit in Norway, the number of exploration wells drilled increased substantially. Can the Minister advise us if the UK Government have indicated whether or not they will follow Norway's example and introduce an exploration tax credit to boost our oil and gas industry and to protect jobs? Uh, uh, well, I can tell Mr Stewart that the UK Government haven't shared with us their, their tax proposals in the budget. Uh, to be fair to the UK Government, at said pilot meeting, they have indicated, and the Treasury civil servant indicated, that consideration has been given to introducing some measures which may encourage exploration. The question will be whether they are sufficient. Mr Stewart points to Norway. They introduced measures in 2005 an exploration tax credit of 78 per cent. Since then, uh, drilling has increased fourfold, and they have discovered two enormous fields, including the Johann Sverdrup field. Uh, and finally, presiding officer, 
the arithmetic is simple. Exploration companies can do four drillings in the Norwegian North Sea for the cost of one exploration drilling in the UK sector. That cannot be right, and that is why we have called on the UK to adopt the Norwegian model. Jackie Bailey. On financial impact, the Scottish Government's statistics released today on public sector revenues shows that for the last quarter of 2014, there was a 55% drop in Scotland's revenue share of North Sea oil, and that was before the price of oil dropped below $50 a barrel. Can the Minister advise how much this means in money terms to the Scottish bu budget, and does he agree that the Barnet bonus in this case is clearly preferable to full fiscal autonomy, so we're not exposed to billions of pounds less revenue for public services due to the drop in oil? Minister? Uh, no. Uh, however, I can in inform uh, the House that per the proposals which I announced on the 8th of January uh, and according to the analysis carried out by Professor Alex Kemp of Aberdeen University, possibly the most respected academic commentator in uh, the UK, that an investment allowance could support between 14,000 and 26,000 jobs a year. The reduction in the supplementary charge could support up to 5,600 jobs per annum across the UK. These are the realities of the matter. And the, we're having a running commentary, uh, presiding officer, uh, which is as relevant as the question was, because, because the answer is this, and I'll conclude with this. Uh, that the amount of tax revenue in future will be substantially by determined by whether the tax measures which the Chancellor introduces in March will be sufficient to reinstill investor confidence. Maximised recovery can only happen if there is investment, and investor confidence will only happen if the tax reductions are sufficient to do that and show that the UK has learnt the lessons of the, the several tax hikes delivered by that party in 2002 and 2005 and those parties in 2011. Gavin Brown. Thank you. Will the Minister publish a new oil and gas analytical bulletin with updated revenue projections? Minister. Until such time as we know what the tax measures are going to be, it is impossible to speculate on what the revenues will be because it is impossible to know what the investment will be. Let me inform the member of uh, one of the many visits, uh, I think between 10 and 15 private visits to operators that I've conducted in Aberdeen or mostly Aberdeen in the past several weeks. One of them outlined precisely to the nearest million pounds uh, the amount of reduced investment in the UK between 500 and 1 billion pounds, one company, the amount, the precise amount of reduced investment in the UK continental shelf as a direct result of the hike to the supplementary charge in 2011. And that is why we must wait and see what the tax deal is before we speculate about what the tax revenue can possibly be. Many thanks. Question six, Neil Bibby. To ask the Scottish Government what action it has taken to improve the economy in the West Scotland region. Secretary John Swinney. The Scottish Government is committed to supporting sustainable economic growth across Scotland, including in the west of Scotland, with infrastructure support and ensuring effective business support. West of Scotland businesses benefit from business support delivered by our enterprise agencies and local authorities. In the past year, there were 17 regional selective assistance awards worth over £8.5 million in creating or safeguarding 1,109 jobs. Over 350, over 350 jobs will be created through the recent awards from the Scottish Government's Regeneration Capital Grant Fund. Neil Bibbitt. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. The Cabinet Secretary will be aware that the Minister for Business recently rejected Renfrewshire Council's proposal for an additional enterprise area based around creative and cultural industries to be established and for Paisley Town Centre to be identified as the first enterprise zone in this theme. An enterprise zone in Paisley Town Centre would build on the existing creative and cultural strengths Paisley already has and be a welcome boost to the area in terms of creating jobs. Can I therefore ask the Cabinet Secretary if he will reconsider his go Government's decision to reject the Council's proposal, which would help revitalise Paisley Town Centre and the local economy? Cap 
the, the, Mr Bibby will be aware that the Government set out its uh, proposals on enterprise areas um, some years ago. We set out that we would take forward a limited number of enterprise areas. We would also take forward other inventive mechanisms to encourage investment, like the tax incremental finance issue, which I discussed with Mr Macdonald just a few moments ago. Um, so there are a range of different ways in which the Government has responded to the aspirations within local communities to uh, deliver a stronger economic future. And I think it, the logic of all of this is that we cannot have enterprise areas in every part of the country, because if we do have that, they will lose the value of trying to tackle particular issues. And if I say to Mr Bibby, one of the enterprise areas is down in Ayrshire, um, focused on the life sciences sector, bringing great rewards to the Ayrshire economy, which is a very strongly challenged economy within Scotland. And the final point I'd say, is that, of course, right across the country, we provide direct support, principally through measures such as the Small Business Bonus Scheme, which will be uh, substantially helping companies in the, um, in the, in the areas. In Renfrewshire, there are an estimated 2,475 business premises that are either paying zero or reduced rates under the, the government's Small Business Bonus Scheme, which is directly beneficial to the local economy in Renfrewshire. Many thanks. And please, could I ask everyone just for brief questions and answers again? Question seven, James Kelly. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government how it allocates money from the budget to capital, uh, capital grant funding for projects. <coughs> secretary. Uh, the spending review establishes the overarching spending priorities for the Government, while the infrastructure investment plan sets out priorities for investment in the long-term strategy for the development of public works in Scotland. The annual draft budget statement gives effect to those strategic spending plans and reflects progress as measured by the Scotland Performance Framework and the ongoing process of debate, engagement and consultation on key areas of government policy. The draft budget is then subject to a number of months of consultation and scrutiny. Individual portfolios, public bodies, local authorities and other spending bodies are best placed to determine project by project capital grant allocations within the strategic framework. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. Can I ask the Cabinet Secretary to examine how capital grant funding commitments could bridge uh, spending review periods? This would allow match funding to be introduced in projects like the University of the West of Scotland, Lanarkshire Campus and Hamilton. Uh, or if progress could be made on that project, it would bring undoubted benefits, not only to the, the area itself, but also to the Lanarkshire economy and the wider Scotland economy. Mr. Swinney? Well, there's a, there's a substantial point in what Mr. Kelly says, which is about uh, long-term planning on capital projects, which is, with which I have absolutely no disagreement at all. Um, the issue, if, if I take, for example, the period that we're in just now, the government has financial data that will provide us with clarity about our capital and resource budgets until March 2016. Um, but we have been able to offer a longer term period of certainty because we have had financial information about this current period since the commencement of the financial year in 2011-12. So we have by and large had about three years of programme funding to enable us to undertake such activity. On the capital programme, what I said to Mr Kelly in my initial answer was that the priorities of the Infrastructure Investment Plan structure our decisions about the projects that will be supported. Um, and that essentially pre-commits spending the views, recognising that some projects take longer than just one year to build. Invariably, they, they, they almost always will do. Um, so I think there's a where we can set out longer-term financial projections, the government will do so. But I hope Mr Kelly understands that my ability to do that at this moment is restricted by the fact that I don't have um, any further sight on our financial allocations beyond March 2016. Mr Scott. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I ask the Cabinet Secretary, the Finance Secretary, to clarify the capital funding for the Anson High School in Lerwick, which has been subject to the uncertainty caused by the change to EU rules uh, from last September with regards to the Scottish Futures Trust? Is he in a position to uh, outline, not possibly today, but uh, to me at some point in the near future, when, funding, uh, when the, when the uh, timescale for funding will be clarified on that project, given that financial closure was due to be completed in the next couple of months? John Swinney. Um, well, I I'm very happy happy to um, brief Mr Scott on all of the issues with which we are wrestling on this question. His command of it is, um, uh, is substantial already, but if he wishes to 
learn more about it and delighted to share ever more of the detail with them. We are trying to resolve this issue as quickly as we possibly can do. Uh, there has been a change to the um, European statistical uh, accounts and that uh, flows through into the United Kingdom's account, uh, accounts and it, it, it has a, a flow through into the budgeting commitments that the government is able to make. One thing I'd say to Mr Scott is I absolutely categorically assure him that the resources are in place to support the Anderson High School. The issue we have to address is how the statistical analysis is concluded, and that work is underway. I have already shared that information with Parliament of the work that we are under undertaking. I commit to updating Parliament on this question in due course, and if Mr Scott would uh, welcome further information, I would be delighted to provide that for him. Excellent. Question 8, Nigel Don. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what representations it has made to the UK Government regarding the feed-in tariff for hydroelectricity schemes. Mr Fergus Ewing. Since June 2013, I and my officials have raised our concerns that the feed-in tariff scheme for hydropower is defective. I have done so on seven separate occasions, but the UK Government have refused to agree to make amendments to the scheme. Uh, thank you, Minister, for that response, but obviously not for what he's just said about it. Is there a risk that if amendments are not made, that Scottish industry will actually lose out as a result? Is you? Well, yes, there is, uh, uh, Presiding Officer. We have a proud record of, of hydro schemes with 1.5 gigawatts of capacity, nearly 90% of total UK hydro capacity. We've consented since 2007 19 hydro applications and a further two pumped storage hydro applications. Uh, and the investment is worth more than £13.8 million to Scotland. However, the flaw in the FIT tariff mechanism has led to industry expressing to the UK Government its concerns that after a glut of hydro developments in order to beat the next cut, next aggression reduction of 20%, possibly, there will then be the real risk of a massive curtailment of further investment after the glut of applications are delivered. That is the worry. I have been unable to persuade the UK Government to amend the scheme, although uh, we have had courteous discussions and they understand the problem. I am hopeful that a planned review in 2015 will, however, let sense prevail and correct what I believe, Presiding Officer, is not a political issue, but a technical defect. Thanks. Question nine, Graham Day. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what its position is on the Cut Tourism VAT campaign. Uh, that is a reserve matter, but the Scottish Government recognises the case made by the Cut Tourism VAT campaign and has long highlighted the current disparity in the high VAT rates levied by the UK Government when compared to the rates of our European competitors. Tourism continues to remain uh, a vital part of Scotland's economy, and this government is committed to driving growth in the sector, including by minimising factors that have a negative effect on Scottish tourism competitiveness. Day. Minister, for that response, I wonder if you can advise me of any evidence from elsewhere in Europe which might support the growing clamour from all sectors of the industry, not to mention 100 plus MPs. Uh, for the UK Government to act in the best interests of tourism across these islands and cut the VAT rate to allow the industry to compete on a level playing field with the rest of the continent? Uh, well, yes, I can, as it happens, uh, share such evidence. Uh, in 25 of the 28 EU countries, they enjoy reduced tourism VAT, with Lithuania amending its rates this year. In fact, only Denmark and Slovenia have higher VAT rates than the UK the rate is 20%, uh, and Ireland in particular has reduced that on tourism from 13.5% to 9%. This was supposed to be temporary in May 11, but in fact it remains in place now because of the benefits which Ireland have enjoyed as a result of cutting that on tourism. Thank you. Question 10, Claire Adamson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on progress since the most recent meeting of the Open Cast Mining Task Force. Mr. Ferdis, you... The group has made progress on both main objectives of securing re-employment and progressing restoration work. The Scottish Government has urged the UK Government to give positive consideration to a proposal from industry which would enable further progress on restoration. 
Peter Adamson. Can I, I thank the Minister for his answer and can I ask if his efforts to deliver a scheme will extend the rebate of carbon tax levy, which currently extends only to slurry, to also apply to coal mine restoration? Minister. Yes, I, I have been working closely with Ian Coburn of Hargreaves, the, the author of these proposals. I understand he has had constructive discussions with HM Treasury. I have had telephone discussions with both Matt Hancock and David Mundell and the presiding officer at a, a fortuitous and accidental encounter with the Chief Secretary to the Treasury in Granton High Street on Saturday, where we both coincidentally happened to be campaigning in connection with another event, uh, I took the opportunity to lobby the Chief Secretary to the Treasury on this matter. I also understand there is an element of cross-party support in the Chamber, or I believe that to be the case, from uh, parties across the Chamber, uh, not the Green Party who are absent, but I think all other parties possibly, and I very much believe that this proposal offers the real possibility of making a very, very substantial uh, uh, progress on tackling the restoration problem of our open cast mines that have been called out in Scotland. Thank you. Alec Rowley. Thank you, President Officer. I welcome um, the the progress that, that has been made and I'm also a supporter of the principle with the Coburn plan and I'm delighted that Fife Council uh, last month put a paper through their executive. Um, I have, I say to the Minister, I have put in a, a motion uh, to, try and get a debate, question, please. to try and get a debate in this place. Would, would he support that motion and support that we have a debate in here in terms of how we move forward? Minister. Uh, well, I believe ministers aren't actually allowed to, to support or sign motions, and for that reason only, I won't be supporting it. Uh, but uh, seriously, the, Mr. Rowley does make the point well, I think, that there is a cross-party support for this. Um, the proposal which has been put would allow almost all of the restoration tasks facing Scotland to be done. It would involve extending the exemption for slurry to restoration coal. It has considerable support within the industry. And it comes at a time when the coal price, presiding officer, has fallen further, leading to serious questions as to whether there will be further redundancies in the sector unless this proposal is enacted. So I'm working with David Mundell, Matt Hancock, Danny Alexander, Alex Rowley, uh, and uh, Murdo Fraser, who's not here, uh, to see if there can be a cross-party approach and that this be implemented swiftly. Uh, otherwise, I fear time may well be against us. Thank you. Question 11, Rod Campbell. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government how it will assist businesses in Lucas following the departure of the RAF. Minister. The Scottish Government strongly disagreed with the UK Government's decision to reduce the number of RAF bases in Scotland from three to one, and with their decision, therefore, to end Lucas' role as an RAF main operating base. Uh, this Government, together with its partners, including Fife Council, is working to assist businesses across Fife with investment and support to help them thrive. Dr. Campbell. The Minister for that answer. The Minister may be aware that some businesses in Lucas are experiencing very significant drops in trade following the departure of two RAF squadrons last year and before the arrival of the Army later this year. To date, it is my understanding that the UK Government, despite request, has not been forthcoming in providing any financial assistance. Will the Minister now agree to come to Lucas to discuss matters with the business community? Uh, yes, I, I received an invitation uh, uh, from Rod Campbell and I'm most happy to accept it. And I also had the opportunity to have a discussion uh, with the Deputy Leader of Fife Council, Leslie Laird, Councillor Leslie Laird, earlier today, and look forward to meeting and discussing the matters with her colleagues as well in a cross-party, non-partisan basis. I do think, Presiding Officer, the MOD does have a responsibility to communities when it pulls out of them. I do hope that they will discharge those responsibilities. I think people feel there's a, a very clear moral responsibility and one which they must obtemper. So I will continue to work with Mr. Campbell and colleagues across other parties in this chamber to persuade them so to do, but to do everything that we can to assist uh, businesses and individuals who may be affected by the decisions the MOD have taken. Many thanks. Question 12, George Adam. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government how income tax powers recommended by the Smith Commission can be implemented. John Swinney. Officer, the Smith Commission recommendations on income tax powers and the UK Government's response make it clear that income tax will be a shared tax that will continue to apply on a UK-wide basis. As such, the implementation of the Smith Commission's recommendations on income tax powers is largely a matter for the UK Government. The Scottish Government will act cooperatively to implement these changes. 
Yes, George Adam. Cabinet Secretary, for his answer, does he agree with me that without full control over Scotland's finances, this Parliament will always have difficulties trying to make the type of life-changing decisions needed for the betterment of the people of Scotland and with the limited powers that are currently on offer? John Swinney. There is a substantive point which relates to the fact that uh, some of the measures that Parliament may wish to take forward, and I just happened to be having a conversation with some external stakeholders earlier today about the issue of childcare, where some of the proposals they were advancing um, would require changes to the United Kingdom tax and benefit system to enable them to have real value for the families that would be affected by those proposals. And I think that illustrates the point that Mr Adam makes, that um, it is only when we have uh, the, the full and combined integration of these responsibilities that we can take some of the transformative decisions that our country requires. Any thanks? Question 13, Rob Gibson. Thank you, President Officer, to ask the Scottish Government what progress has been made in devolving the powers of the Crown Estate. John Swinney. So, and officer, the Smith Commission recommendations are clear that responsibility for management of the Crown Estate's economic assets out to 200 nautical miles in Scotland should be transferred to the Scottish Parliament. Once the Crown Estate uh, has been devolved, we plan to develop a new framework for the management of these assets and the associated income. We are continuing discussions with the Crown Estate and the UK Government to ensure that the draft clauses on the Crown Estate properly implement the Smith Commission recommendations. In parallel, we will bring together stakeholders in this early stage of the development of a new framework for the management of Crown Estate assets in Scotland. Thank you. Rob Gibson. Uh, I thank the Deputy First Minister for that answer. Coastal communities have asked if proceeds of offshore renewables of uh, associated cables and pipelines are at more than 12 miles offshore will attract revenues for their use. Uh, is it the Cabinet Secretary's intention to make sure that coastal communities will be able to access revenue from the proceeds of offshore renewables, including those uh, items at more than 12 miles offshore? Um, the Smith Commission recommendations um, will enable us to make sure that island and coastal local authorities receive 100 per cent of net revenues generated from Scottish territorial waters adjacent to their coast. The arrangements for distributing income generated from Crown Estate rights more than 12 miles offshore will be developed in Scotland by Parliament with input from stakeholders once the powers are devolved. And I can assure Mr Gibson that there will be full and extensive consultation with coastal communities in that process. Briefly as you can, please, Mary Scanlon. Uh, thank you. Can I, I just briefly say that some tenant farmers in the Crown Estate and Murray are concerned that their voices will not be heard during the consultation process moving towards uh, more devolved powers for the Crown Estate. So can I just ask the Minister if he will ensure within Murray that the rural portfolio, the tenant farmers and all local stakeholders will be involved in the process going forward? Cabinet Secretary. I think Mr Scanlon makes a, an important point that it's, um, uh, I think the debate about the Crown Estate is often just considered about the offshore um, activities. There are, of course, many onshore interests of the Crown Estate, and it is essential that uh, every one of those interested parties has the opportunity to participate in the consultation. I give an assurance that that will be the case. Any thanks? Question 14, David Dorns. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what additional funding has allocated to Fife Council to protect services. The Scottish Government is providing Fife Council with a total revenue funding allocation of £683.1 million in 2015 16, which represents a like with like increase of over £3.5 million compared to their funding for the current year. In addition, the Fife Council will receive a capital grant allocation of £42.1 million next year, which represents an increase of £3.8 million compared to this year. Many thanks. David Torrance. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for his answer. Can I ask the Cabinet Secretary if the Leader of Fife Council has signed up to agreement to protect teacher numbers through additional funding which will be made available by the Scottish Government? Uh, the, uh, the Government has made clear to local authority leaders that we require um, their response to our proposals that were set out in the Budget in Parliament earlier this month uh, by this coming Friday, and I look forward to receiving confirmation uh, to that effect uh, from local authorities around the country. Many thanks. Question 15, Dave Stewart. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what it is doing to boost the economy around Inverness and Nairn. Cabinet Secretary John Swinney. 
Uh, the Scottish Government has invested heavily in health, education and connectivity in the Highlands and Islands. Specific examples include the £30 million design contract for the A96 Inverness to Aberdeen dueling programme, including the Nairn Bypass, and the £30 million investment by Hansan's Enterprise in Inverness campus. Uh, this investment complements work being taken forward across the region to deliver sustainable economic growth. Ms. Stewart. Thank you, President Officer. Does the Cabinet Secretary share my view that infrastructural transport projects are vital drivers in stimulating the local economy? I welcome the Scottish Government commitment to dual late A96 between Inverness and Nairn. However, it is crucial that rail on neighbouring Inverness to Aberdeen line is dualed as well. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree? Cabinet Secretary. There are a, a number of uh, developments underway to support the upgrade of the Inverness to uh, Aberdeen Rail Link. Uh, it is an important connection that uh, they will form part of the uh, Government's investment programme. Um, the, we announced uh, £170 million of investment in March 2014 in the Inverness to Aberdeen Railway. That will fund um, improvements in, to increase the number of trains, to improve signalling, to lay infrastructure for new stations and to enhance timetable services. Thank you. That ends question time. The next point of order, Mary Scanlon. Sir, I appreciate that you were not in the chair for uh, questions. Can I seek your advice regarding who determines whether a question is irrelevant, whether it is the presiding officers or indeed the ministers? This afternoon we have heard from uh, Fergus Ewing, who determined a supplementary question was not relevant. This was not ruled as being out of order by Deputy Presiding Officer John Scott. Um, as uh, Mrs Scanlon knows, because um, we have said many times before, I am not responsible for the answers that come uh, from ministers or anybody else. The next item of business is a debate on motion number 12325 in the name of Jenny Mara on protecting Scotland's communities. Members who wish